Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Let's talk about a major criminal investigation that's in the news. It involves the murder of a newlywed in South Africa on her honeymoon. Her name was Annie Dewani. Right, there are conflicting versions of what happened. But just understand that the South African government right now believes that her husband, Shirian Dewani, arranged to have his wife killed as the couple honeymooned in South Africa. Now she was killed by people who ambushed the car they were in, hijacked the car, forced the cab driver and Mr. Duani out of the car before robbing Annie Duani and shooting her in the neck. Now that's what Mr. Duani would like for all of us to believe. That's his version of the events. He also maintains that his newlywed wife was the love of his life. Right? That, it was the wife's idea. Not his idea. To honeymoon in South Africa. He also claims that it was the cab driver's idea. Not his idea. To visit a South African township. There is video of him paying the cab driver three days after the murder took place. It's his contention that he was simply paying the cab driver for having served as a tour guide during the couple's time in South Africa. Right? Now that's his version of events. Understand the prosecution has a different version of events. According to the prosecution, Mr. Duani and his newlywed wife, Annie, go on vacation, their honeymoon, in South Africa. Right? Rather than take the free hotel shuttle from the airport, instead, Mr. Duani hires a cab driver who he has never met before. And outside of his wife's presence with the cab driver after they arrive at the hotel, he quickly arranges to have his wife murdered. Right? He tells the cab driver that he wants a woman, doesn't say it's his wife, taken care of. They both understand what that means. He asked the cabbie if the cabbie can make the necessary arrangements and that the payoff would be 15,000 rand, right? Money to the people who do the killing, 5,000 rand to the cab driver. <coughs> the plan was to make the murder look like a robbery. Hired assailants. Assailants hired through the cab driver would hijack the car they were in. The cab driver and husband would then be let out of the car before the assailants proceeded with killing his wife. Right? So that's the, uh, that's the prosecution theory of the case. The cab driver then... <clears throat> supposedly contacted a friend who worked at a hotel who hired the assailants right now understand there is footage <coughs> of the cabbie talking with the friend the conversation is a brief one but understand that the friend supports the cabbie's version of events. There's also later footage of the friend talking to one of the assailants or another third party talking about the cuts 
that the assailants were to receive. Right? According to the prosecution, this murder was financed. Well, after the uh, cab driver contacts the friend who allegedly hires the assailants, the cab driver later drives the husband to a black market money-changing place to convert U.S. dollars into rand, right? The prosecution's evidence is not only the cab driver, but the people at the money-changing place. Now, on the night the assault was to take place, the cab driver was running late. He had the couple in the car with him, right? They were supposedly driving to dinner. <clears throat> but when they reached the hijack point, they were supposed to be ambushed. The hijackers were supposed to take over the car, get rid of the cabbie, get the husband out of the car, right, and then proceed with the plan. But because the cab driver was running late, this is according to the cab driver, he missed the assailants. The assailants must have thought the operation was off. So he then drove the couple to dinner. Right? Keep in mind, they were ostensibly going to dinner. He then completes the journey. The couple's at dinner. We actually have closed-circuit television of the couple walking into dinner, right? While the couple's at dinner, <coughs> he claims that the husband texts him to remind him that the murder had to happen that night, right? The cab driver then connects with the assailants, contacts the assailants to get the ambush plan back on track right now here's where it gets interesting the couple leaves the restaurant right they finish dinner according to their waiter the couple was distant from each other they didn't come across as a couple on a honeymoon right there at the restaurant for less than an hour they apparently only stayed long enough to have appetizers, according to some reports. So they leave to get back in the car. There's other evidence we'll discuss that suggests that the couple wasn't a happily married couple, that there was some tension, some friction between the two of them. Right? So they get back in the car. And of course, if you believe the prosecution, the cab driver knows that they're driving to the ambush. The husband knows that they're driving to the ambush. The only person who doesn't know is the intended murder victim, the wife. It's during this drive that the cab driver claims that from the front seat of the vehicle, while he's driving this cab, and he sends a text message to the husband seated in the back seat of the vehicle. That text message basically says, what about the money? Right? Because the husband is supposed to make a payment of at least 10,000 rand to the assailants. We're going to do the murder. And according to the South African government's prosecution team, the husband from the back seat with his wife next to him texts the cabbie back and says, you know, the money will be in an envelope behind the passenger seat of the cab. In other words, the husband has surreptitiously, while he's in the cab, put an envelope behind the passenger seat that is intended to pay 
for the assassination of his wife. <coughs> Again, this is the prosecution's version. Right? So then, of course, it goes according to plan. They reach the ambush spot. Some assailants come up next to the car with guns. They um, hop in the car. If you believe the prosecution, they're in the car for not that long a time. If you believe the husband, they're in the car for 40 minutes. But they eventually force the cabbie out the car. They force the husband out the car. They then proceed to rob the wife, shoot her in the neck, killing her. Now let me point out that the husband is then left roaming around the township. Right? Someone at the township sees the husband. Right? He doesn't know what happened to his wife because he was booted out of the car, he claims, through a window. Right? They forced him out a window of the vehicle. He's booted out of the vehicle, left on the side of the road with his wife still alive in the, in the car, right? So he's later found by someone who claims that the husband was distraught, right? Claims that the husband looked concerned about his wife, looked shaken up. Eventually, the husband is taken back to his hotel, where the cabbie has also been taken back to, right, independently. And of course the cab driver also looks distraught. Now according to the cab driver, the husband and he shared a nod and a wink moment as they both looked at each other looking distraught because they both knew that it was all an act, that the murder had been orchestrated, right? Now, three days later, the cabbie returns to the hotel, meets with the man, and gets an envelope that has some money in it. The cabbie claims the man owed him 5,000 rand for the killing. We know that the man gave the cabbie an envelope. The cabbie claims the envelope <coughs> only had 1,000 rand in it and that it was for payment for the killing. Of course, the man claims that the payment was actually for just the cabbie services as a tour guide. Right? Let me also point out, too, that the amount of the payment, whether it's a thousand rand or five thousand rand, seems awfully cheap for a murder given the risk of being caught, right? A thousand rand is consistent with paying a cab driver for being a tour guide, right? So, let's get at some questions in the case. And these are the questions that, quite frankly, need to be asked, right? Let's try to cut through all the spin. Mr. Duwani has hired Max Clifford to do his PR, and we're getting a lot of PR stories, as you can imagine. The South African government obviously wants to make sure that the country isn't unfairly impacted by this crime and doesn't have a lowered international profile that might cost them in decreased tourism. So everyone has an agenda here. Let's try to get under the hood of this car and get at what actually happened. These are the questions that I think need to be asked at the risk of being politically incorrect. The first question is, is Shirian Dewani credible? Now the focus here is simply on whether he has told any lies 
that may lead us to believe that he has a problem with the truth. If he's told demonstrable lies, then that should affect the weight of the evidence that he gives. Okay? So, number one. The first question is how much did he love his wife? I believe this question cuts to the heart of the case. Men who have just gotten married, who believe they have married the love of their lives, wouldn't have their wives assassinated on their honeymoons. Right now here, understand, there may be some red flags. <coughs> the first is that it looks like the wife didn't know Mr. Duwani that well. Their romance was a long distance romance. She lived in Sweden. He lived in the United Kingdom. Right? Now understand that there is the distinct possibility that Mr. Duwani, while he was courting his wife, in the months leading up to his wedding, had other lovers, right? At least two men have come forward and have claimed that they were romantically or at least intimately, let's say physically, involved with Mr. Duwani at the same time that Mr. Duwani was supposedly on his way to marrying Annie Duwani, the murder victim. Right now, people's sexual orientations are their business. The point here isn't that Mr. Duwani may have been gay or bisexual. <coughs> Rather, the point is more foundational. Mr. Duwani claims that these claims are preposterous. They're crazy. Didn't happen. Right? One of the men claims that his relationship with Duwani was long-standing and that they would meet at public bathhouses. In my opinion, either Duwani's telling the truth about this or he's not. If someone is making allegations that they were your lover for a while and that the two of you would meet in public locations, then there should be other people who know about the relationship. Right? I can tell you here in California we have a jury instruction that if you believe that someone testifying under oath has lied to you about topic A, then you can discount their testimony on topic B, C, and D. Right? The issue is credibility. Either Mr. Duwani is telling the truth that his wife was the love of his life, she was the only one he was seeing, or he is not. If he's not telling the truth here, why should we believe him about anything else? The issue also goes to the idea of was his marriage real? Did he consider it real? Was this for show or was this authentic? Did he love his wife Annie, <coughs> I would argue that if he has been lying to Annie, if she doesn't know about these other lovers, if they existed, then that would cast doubt on his purpose in getting married. Right? Let me also point out, too, 
that their relationship had other wrinkles. According to the show Dispatches, Mr. Duwani refused to have sex with his fiance before they got married. Right now, to many, that's noble. Right to many, that's noble. But understand, you know, to some, that's unusual. Especially in this context where there are allegations that during that period of time where he was abstaining from having sex with his fiance, he may have been having sex with other people. Right? Understand, too, there are reports that on their wedding night, the couple wasn't intimate even then. They apparently had an argument that day and spent their wedding night apart. Let's talk about other things that should be considered here. I believe these are the key questions. <coughs> why does closed circuit television, we'll call it CCTV, why does CCTV appear to support portions of the cab driver's story? Now let me just point out, the cab driver accepted a plea deal, right, where he might be able to get out of prison after serving seven years. The wife's family, excuse me, the murder victim's father, right, perhaps the entire family, but certainly the murder victim's father, her next of kin actually signed off on the plea deal, right? The plea deal doesn't go through without the consent of the murder victim's father. Okay, so that should tell you that the murder victim's family has an interest in finding out where this investigation leads. Okay? As part of the plea deal, the cab driver had to reveal what happened. They wanted to know. <coughs> the cab driver could conceivably get significantly longer than seven years. He might be in prison for up to 18 years. Just food for thought. But the cab driver's story, and the cab driver is a cabbie, right? He's not a university professor. The cab driver's story mysteriously sinks with CCTV of his interactions with Mr. Duwani, the initial interaction. Understand, the cab driver would be revealed as a fraud if he claimed to have talked with Mr. Duwani, but yet the television footage showed that no such conversation took place. Right, we would then say, well, wait a moment. When did these guys plan this murder? But in fact, the footage actually supports his contention that when he drives the couple to the hotel and they get to the hotel, Mr. Duwani is able to separate himself from his wife and actually have two lengthy conversations with the cab driver. In fact, the conversations total something like 17 minutes. <coughs> and it's during these conversations where Mr. Duwani has just arrived in South Africa, has just met the cab driver, and apparently is chatty with him outside the presence of his wife. It's during these conversations that the cab driver contends that the murder plot was hatched. Right? The footage supports the contention. The cab driver is on film talking with Mr. Duwani outside the presence of the eventual murder victim. Right? Some other parts of the cab driver's story are supported 
by CCTV. Right? The cab driver actually is on film visiting with his friend who works in a hotel who then arranges to hire the assailants. <coughs> the cab driver claims that later in the dinner the couple had, the husband and wife, their last meal together right before the ambush, he claims that the husband texted him to remind him that the murder had to take place that night. And sure enough, the CCTV shows from that restaurant the husband texting someone during the meal. Right? Let me also point out, too, that the CCTV in my opinion, shows that there's some distance between the couple. Because as they walk into the restaurant, the husband's clearly walking ahead of the murder victim. As they walk out of the restaurant, the husband's walking ahead of the murder victim. They aren't even cuddled up. The one time you think they would be. On their honeymoon. Let me point out, too, that the CCTV shows you the meeting between the husband and the cab driver three days after the murder, where the husband gives the cab driver an envelope filled with cash. That, too, is on the closed-circuit television. <coughs> also, the closed-circuit television even shows his friend talking to the assailants on the telephone at least talking to somebody discussing the cuts the financial takes the financial shares that the assailants are supposed to get for the murder who's supposed to pay these shares the cabbie think about it also just by chance Right? You know, the cab driver has some story of the husband wanting his wife killed. There's no evidence that the cab driver knows the waiter at the restaurant. But yet the waiter, who served the last meal, told authorities that the couple looked distant, that there wasn't any closeness between the couple. Is it by chance that the cab driver's idea that this relationship was doomed is actually the same opinion that the waiter comes up with, the fact that the couple's not close? Because my point is simply, if the cab driver's totally making up a story out of thin air, wouldn't the story have been discredited by the couple looking close to the people around them? This couple didn't even come across that way. <coughs> Let's talk about other issues that need to be considered. One that comes to mind is the idea of why does the murder victim's behavior in the days leading up to the murder support the idea that the couple was unhappy? We don't have to be experts looking at CCTV footage of the couple. All we have to do is look at the text messages and statements that the murder victim made to her friends in the days leading up to the murder. She told one friend, crying is my new hobby. Right? Allegedly she called her new husband a monster. She sent text messages about her dissatisfaction with the relationship. She apparently even raised the issue of divorce with her family. This is within days of being married. Now here again, credibility is an issue. 
the husband claims they were happily married. Right? The husband claimed to son that they were irritating some of the other guests at the hotel because they were so happy together. It can't be both. Right? It can't be both. Let's talk about a few more things. On the day of the murder, <coughs> the murder victim tells her father, this is according to the father, that she had big news. Right? This is after having discussed divorce in the preceding days with her family. She tells the father she has big news and is looking forward to talking with him after the trip. That's the last time he talks with her. Let me also point out that at the dinner, she's wearing a mini skirt. In my opinion, that mini skirt is inconsistent with wanting to visit a South African township. Right? South African townships are not the wealthy part of town. Right? You're in a foreign country. How provocatively do you want to dress before you visit the tough part of town? Right? This woman was dressed in a mini skirt. We know that from the closed circuit television. Right? In my opinion, it wasn't her idea to drive through the township. Let's get to the next question. And again, keep in mind, the cab driver is not a university professor. This is a guy who, you know, is picking up passengers at the airport. Right? <coughs> The timeline doesn't support an idea that the cab driver has literally prepared some vast alibi and major conspiracy involving all aspects of the case. So, the third issue is, why does the money trail appear to support the cab driver's story? Understand, we know that the husband withdraws 1,000 pounds on his MasterCard, including 800 pounds on his MasterCard the day his wife is killed. Right? Understand the 1,000 pounds is more than 10,000 rand. Above and beyond from his withdrawals on the MasterCard. According to the cabbie, and according to people at the place, the cab driver took the husband to a black market money-changing place, where the husband converted 1,500 U.S. dollars to Rand. Right, so the husband is converting a lot of money to Rand. Right, we know that payment of at least some of it. The cab driver claims a thousand Rand, when it should have been five thousand Rand, was made to the cab driver three days after the murder. <coughs> right, the question is what happened to all this money? What was the husband getting? all this money for. We know that when the hijack takes place, the husband has 4,000 Rand on him, which the hijackers take. Right? Where's the rest of the money? Why did the husband need all of this money? So for me, the case comes down to the following. If I were a juror, here are the smoking guns I'm looking for, right? For guilt or innocence. 
for me, it comes down to the tax evidence, right? In particular, one specific exchange of tax, right? The tax that take place as they're on the way to the hijack. If there are text messages and there are three people in the car at that point, the cab driver, the murder victim, the husband. If there is a text exchange, <coughs> according to phone records, between the cab driver and the husband during that car ride, I would vote guilty. That would be enough for me. There's enough here where if I felt that the husband and cabbie are communicating privately instead of verbally, but privately with the murder victim on the car, uh, in the car, on the car ride to her eventual death, then I would feel that the husband is part of the conspiracy. I mean, we know there's a conspiracy. We know there's a conspiracy. Right? We know the cabbie's part of the conspiracy. The guy he contacted who hired the assailants is part of the conspiracy. And the assailants are part of the conspiracy. We know there's a conspiracy. If I'm a juror, I'm simply looking to see whether the husband is part of the conspiracy. In my opinion, if the husband is secretly or privately texting the cab driver in the front seat on the fateful car ride, I would vote to convict. In my opinion, that would be evidence that the husband is part of the conspiracy. <coughs> Likewise, if the husband can prove what he did with all the money, right? He goes to a money changing place. He takes money out on his MasterCard. If he has receipts, receipts from the hotel, receipts from here and there, if he has receipts and an explanation and vendors who are prepared to say, Yes, he was with us. For example, we know he stayed at the hotel. If he claims that the money went to the hotel bill, he could have paid in cash. And the hotel says, yes, he did pay us according to our records. In other words, if there's no money left over to pay the assailants, then in my opinion, the case would be unproven and I would vote not guilty. Either the murder is financed or it's not. If the husband didn't pay the assailants to commit the murder, then in my opinion, there isn't enough evidence to convict Mr. Duwani. Right? So if I'm a juror, I'm looking at the money. I want to know what happened to it. We know that 4,000 Rand were taken by the assailants during the hijacking, right? In addition to jewelry and stuff like that. I want to know what happened to the rest of the guy's money. <coughs> if the guy can prove what he did with the money, then I'll vote not guilty. If he can't, then I'm going to have to look at other things. I'm going to have to continue to consider the case. Let's go further. If there's no smoking gun, for guilt or innocence, then I'm going to have to look at the credibility of the people involved. Let's talk about the husband's credibility for a moment. At his extradition hearing, there was bombshell evidence that the husband supposedly told some of the other co-conspirators that he had been involved in an earlier South African killing. I'd like to know more about that earlier South African killing. He doesn't have to have been in the country 
to be involved in financing a killing. Right? He doesn't. So I'd like to know if there's any factual connection between the husband and any other killing. If there is, then I'll know that this guy has the kind of depraved heart that would allow him to participate in killings. Right? Let me also say, too, that I would be curious to find out if there are any demonstrable lies that this guy has told with regard to his relationship with his wife and this trip. So, the entire idea of honeymooning in South Africa, whose idea was it? Right? I believe the wife's family believes that this was sprung on her. Right? She didn't talk to them about honeymooning in South Africa until the last minute. I'd like to know if the husband is contending that the idea was the wife's, if there's any evidence to suggest that the idea was the husband's. Right? Again, this goes to the weight that I'm going to assign to the evidence, whether I think he's credible. I also want to know more about whether he had other lovers while he was supposedly in a relationship with the murder victim. Again, the issue isn't sexual orientation. The issue for me is credibility. If the guy has a pattern of lying, that's going to impact the weight that I give to his testimony. <coughs> I also want to hear from him what he was talking with outside the presence of his wife with the cab driver. I also want to hear from him who he was texting while he was having dinner with his wife on their honeymoon. Think about that. I believe most guys understand you put away the phone when you're with your wife on your honeymoon having dinner. Right? Who's he texting? The cab driver claims he was texting him to remind him that a murder had to take place. Who's he texting? Also, why did he pay the cab driver three days after the murder? I think there are many people who, if you're on a cab ride with your newlywed wife, and you get hijacked and your wife gets killed, there are a lot of people who would not be out there paying the cab driver after the murder. You might even think that you've been set up, that the cab driver was in on the murder. Here, he looks relaxed on the CCTV. He looks like he's smiling when he pays the cab driver. It's even worse than that. He apparently was with members of his wife's family. He leaves them to go pay the cab driver in a different room. I'd want to know why. Also, he calls his father-in-law after the murder before they found the body all he knows at that point is that his wife's been kidnapped he was in a car with her there's been a hijack he was ejected from the car and his wife is still missing he calls his father-in-law he says to his father-in-law I'm sorry I cannot take care of your daughter father-in-law explains to him, hey, look, they might still find her. If she's been kidnapped, we'll make whatever payment we need to make to get her free. And apparently the husband repeats the line, I'm sorry, I could not take care of your daughter. Why that choice of words? 
why not more optimism about her eventual release? I mean, didn't the ambush guys release him? Right? Why not more optimism? What's going on there? Right? So, I have questions. I also have questions about the cab driver's credibility. <coughs> right? You've just picked up a total stranger. This guy starts talking about killing somebody. Why are you even continuing the conversation? Also, he doesn't talk to his friend at the hotel who allegedly hires the assailants for that law. Right? Has this guy been involved in the past? with arranging crimes either for tourists or against tourists. I'd like to know. I'd like the friend at the hotel to be questioning the same thing. Better yet, I'd like authorities to go through film footage because they have film footage of the friend at the hotel discussing the cuts the assailants were to get. I'd like for them to go through the prior CCTV footage with a fine tooth comb to find if there are any other conversations in this guy's past that could be construed as discussing the commissions of crimes. Is this a rare event? Some guy shows up and wants you to kill a woman who turns out to be his wife? Or is this a business model where this cabbie knows, okay, people come here with sketchy requests, <coughs> I'll outsource the requests to my connect who has ties to guys who can pull off the crimes, right? So I'd like to know a little bit more about the cabbie, but I will say this, this is a real case. The CCTV seems to support at least some portions of the cabbie's story. Right? Some major portions of the cabbie story. I think any argument that this should be dismissed, that the case against the husband should be dropped, that there is not enough evidence to seriously consider the husband as being part of the conspiracy to kill his wife, I think those arguments are misguided. I encourage everyone to look at the CCTV footage. Understand, too, there are problems with the husband's story. He claims he was pushed out of a window. The window on the vehicle he was in may not have been able to go down all the way. The person who finds the husband roaming around a township says that the husband looked well-dressed. His clothes didn't look like he had just been in a scuffle. Right? The husband's version of events is inconsistent with the version being offered by third parties with no dog in the hunt. Right? So in my opinion, the right decision has been made. The husband should be extradited. Right? He should face a court proceeding in South Africa. There are questions here that need to be answered. It's a real case. There is a chance here that the state's theory of the case is the correct one. It should be investigated. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online, and I hope you visit us in the future, I'm going to try to discuss other cases that have been in the news. Thanks for stopping by.